And so in my frustration, I said to my friend, I'm like, hey, I, yeah, I'm afraid people are going to hear this and they're going to think there's been some kind of moral failure. And, and he stopped me and he's like, um, hey, you, you know, you are a moral failure, right? Like, you know that, right? <laughs> and, uh, and I'm like, no, you know what I mean? Like, you, you know, you know what I'm trying to say? And he's like, no, like you're, you are, if you spend these next three months concerned about what degree of moral failure people think you are, then you don't really know the gospel very well. Welcome to the Kerry Newhoff Leadership Podcast. I hope this next episode helps you thrive in life and leadership. And if you enjoy it, hit the like button and subscribe to my channel. That way you'll never miss a thing. Pastors, I know how hard it can be to keep your sermons feeling fresh and relevant, and especially you're preaching week after week. So maybe you hit a writer's block or it's Friday and you haven't really finished things up. I want to help. So I've got a 10 step preaching cheat sheet. After decades of preaching, I simplified the whole prep process into a series of steps and reminders that can help you ensure your sermons are engaging, relevant, and memorable. Super easy to use, 10 simple prompts with examples, and you can start using it as early as this Sunday. So visit preachingcheatsheet.com or click the link in the description and you'll get a copy sent to you for free today. This episode is also presented by 10 by 10. Did you know that approximately 1 million young people in America drift from their faith every year? And this means that by 2034, 10 million young people will walk away from their faith and miss out on experiencing the abundant life that Jesus promised. Well, imagine if we could do something to reverse this. That's why 10 by 10 was born, a national initiative created to help make faith matter more to 10 million young people over the next 10 years. Together, we can turn the tide of young people walking away from their faith. So the question is, will you answer the call to help 10 by 10 advocate for the faith of the next generation? You can go to 1010 Dot org to learn more. That's 1010.org to learn more. And now to today's episode. Kyle, welcome back. It's good to have you. It's really good to be back with you. Thanks for having me. Uh, you were telling me you did a sabbatical, uh, sort of post-COVID recovery or previously scheduled meeting, or what was that? Well, you know, it was partly your idea. I, uh, uh, okay. I was on a I was on what I thought was a little bit of a extended vacation. I was taking a week and a half off for the first time in like four or five years. I just kept putting it off thinking, mm. okay, I'm going to have a time here. It's going to, there's going to be a window, but I wasn't doing it. And um, during that time, I listened to a number of books, but one of them was your audio book. And um, you talked in there about Correct me if I'm wrong on this, but the difference between I want to say time management and energy management mm -hmm. was this was a big it must thing have been at me. your best, yeah. Okay, and um, and I started to recognize that my issue here isn't just time management; it's energy management. Um, and I took some time away, and then realized I needed more time away. So I, here's what that looked like: I um, I went away and thought I'm going to write for like three weeks and. Um, just get as much cranked out as I could. And after like a week of writing, I had almost nothing to show for it. Like I <laughs> I've, I've done this. that before. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's the worst. It's horrible. Oh yeah. I had like four pages, right? Uh -huh. And it's the, the metaphor I use is it's like putting a bucket into a well over and over again. And there's just no water. There's no water in there. <laughs> And, uh, and so, you know, out of that, just recognizing the need to dig that well deeper and needing to take some time. I, so I came back from what I thought was going to be a bit of a writing break. And I, I told my elders, I said, Hey, I, I need, I need a month just off. I just need a month off. And they came back and said, yeah, we think you should take three months off. And I didn't want to take three months off. I wanted to take a month off, you know, uh, I felt like there was a lot to be done and it wasn't the right time. Um, it didn't feel planned and intentional enough to me. Um, so I went from taking, thinking I was going to take a month off to it being three months. Um, and at first I resisted it. I went home though and I told my wife, I'm like, hey, they, they're, they're telling me I need to take three months off. Um, they were concerned about 
you, you know, they knew I hadn't been myself lately. And mm-hmm. I think when somebody says I need three months or I need a month off, I just need to be left alone. I think that was my exact quote, <laughs> you know, that that's a little bit of a, um, you know, that's a little bit of a concern. So, so before, before you go further, w- yep. why do you think you only got like four pages? What, when you look back on that, what were you, di- how would you diagnose it? You know, I think it was an input output issue. I, I was over the last number of years very focused on output and not much on input. And in fact, what I began to recognize is that everything that I considered input, I was also doing output. It would be like going on a retreat to get input, but I'm also speaking at the retreat or I'm, I'm going <laughs> yeah. on a vacation to rest, but I'm also trying to hit my writing deadline and playing a sermon series. And so I was not um, having input that was pure, right? I was always trying to connect it to efficiency. Um, In my mind, I was well-intentioned, like I'm going to make the most of this time by having something to show for it. Um, But I don't think that was sustainable. And um, and so just being out of balance with output input. You know, it's funny. I'm, I'm gonna. I really want to hear the rest of the story, but I I lived in that tension for a long time as a leader too, and I've never said this publicly. So you know, here come the emails. But now, when I think about that, like a retreat where I'm also speaking. So let's say it's a two day retreat. I'm there for the two days, but I'm speaking. I now consider that work. Quote mm-hmm. work. It's 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 ministry. I get it, and it's definitely something I do out of a calling but that's not a vacation. And if I get a, or a break, like, cause you kind of have to be on and you're sort of on in public and people are going to want to talk to you. I don't know. Do, do you think of it that way? I'm just like, Oh, that's not, that's not downtime. That's work. Yes. So I would think of it exactly like that. I enjoyed those things. Me too. So I, I felt like they were replenishing and I think they were, but they were still work related. It was still output. It was still requiring okay something of me. And my focus then was not on, on uh, growth or replenishment. It wasn't on digging that well deeper. It was on, you know, pulling water up out of it. And so I, I think I thought because I liked it and because I enjoyed it, it was meeting an, uh, an input need that it wasn't meeting. Mm. Okay. So you come back, you're depleted and you realize, I think I need a month off. Yeah. I came back and um, I think my exact words were, you know, I just need to be left alone for a month. And, and I, <laughs> I, I sat down with a few of our elders and, and shared that. And they came back to me and said, hey, we think you need three months. And um, I wouldn't have done that otherwise. Like, I didn't think what, there was- What made them say that? Like, do you know? Um, I, yeah, they, I, they would say I hadn't been myself for a little while. Um, I think because when I came back and was feeling- um, like, hey, I need a month off. When somebody comes and says that, then it's probably a good indication that they need more than a month off, right? And um, and so I think they recognized that. They had talked about the need to have some of that uh, in place, and we were going to plan it out further, but just saying, you know what, let's just do it. And I, I was resistant at first, and then I went home and told my wife about it, and I was kind of venting to her, like, I can't believe there, it's going to be three months. I just wanted a month break. And, and I think she said, you know, thank you, Jesus, right? Like, <laughs> the, I saw in her eyes that I should be welcoming it the way that she was welcoming it, that I was resisting something uh, that could be a gift, like I could accept it as a gift. And, um, and so that began uh, a three-month sabbatical. Um, after what had just been, a, you know, in 2019, we transitioned, I became a senior pastor and then, you know, six months into it, COVID hit and it had just been kind of a marathon and, um, I didn't know how much I needed it. Okay. What did you do with those three months? Like, did you decide I'm now I'm going to write the book or are you like books off the table and I'm going to do something else? How, how did you spend that? Well, you know, the book that I had been working on, you know, it's called When Your Way Isn't Working. And when I was <laughs> writing it initially, it wasn't supposed to be about my way. It's supposed to be about, <laughs> you know, everybody else's way. Um, uh-huh. And it came out of just a time as a pastor of seeing people feeling more than discouraged, but disillusioned by um, 
a recognition of what they'd put their hope in or what they were trying to lean on. It wasn't holding them up. I, it just became more of a personal journey for me that I did process during the sabbatical by writing. I didn't know if I would put that in the form of a book or not, but I knew that for me, thinking through those things by by writing was going to be helpful. And so I was trying not to write it for productivity purposes, right? Like if you're taking a sabbatical because you need a break from production, then trying to write a book is probably not the right approach. Uh, So that wasn't necessarily uh, the plan, but it ended up being a time of personal reflection. So the book is much more personal than Hmm. I'm comfortable with or probably would have done otherwise. Um, and I used that time, those three months. The first month or so was just a time to kind of rest, renew. The second month uh, was more of a time to grow, focus on resetting some things. And then the third month was really about, uh, you know, reengaging and coming back into things um, a little bit slowly, not all at once. Um, So I don't know that that is a perfect way to do it. I think it would have been helpful to plan further ahead. That wasn't, you know, quite so uh, impromptu, but the timing was right. You know, it's funny. I've, I've had a number of friends who've done three months sabbatical. So I've had a month off at a time. That's it. And mm-hmm. so far to date, that's, that's worked great for me. Um, but that whole pattern of first season, like first month, unplug, recharge, you're way more tired than you thought you were. Mm-hmm. Second month, try to get some kind of rhythm that's yes. enjoyable, do some enjoyable things. Then third month, it's sort of like, uh-oh, we're going back on to the Starship Enterprise. So now what, right? You're, you're sort of preparing your mind to re-engage and deal with the issues. What were some things you learned about yourself? I learned that I didn't miss the stage. Like I thought wow. it would be really hard for me to not preach and teach as much as anything. I thought it would be hard for me to have somebody else preach and teach messages that I had planned and, you know, had Mm. been working towards. Um, I hadn't had a season of not being on stage or, you know, behind a microphone for decades. Right. And so just having that time away made me realize I'm okay. Like I, Wow. I'm okay if I don't do this. And there was something incredibly freeing for me uh, in that. And just to find out that I love this, I feel called to it, but I'm okay if I don't do it. I, I, um, I would not have known that. I, so as much as anything, the three-month span was helpful in taking that much time out of the spotlight and off of the stage. I think one of the things all of us in leadership, particularly in pastoral ministry, struggle with is, is my work my identity? And it's always a false question because we end up going back to our work, right? Usually. Did you learn anything about your identity um, during those three months? I, I talk about this some in the book. I learned that my identity isn't necessarily so tied to my role as it is to productivity. Like I value myself based on what I can point to based on production, whether that is a, a book or a sermon or an article or, or goals that are uh, set and met. So for me, the, the sabbatical kind of forced my identity to be more rooted in connection and less production. And that's changed how I do everything. Um, I, I used to really organize my life and my calendar all around the production side of it. Here are the things that need to get done. I'm working on organizing all those things around connection and then finding the space for production. So I really flipped that metric. But I, I learned in that season that my identity was overly tied to productivity. Even if it wasn't a mm. role, I don't know that it was the role. It was just... right. Here's what I got done. Because if it was over at Southeast, you'd find something else to produce. Right. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Talk about um, productivity and connection. Production and connection. That's really interesting. So how I'm I'm reworking through Pete Scazzaro's Emotionally Healthy Discipleship. And he kind of talks about that a little bit. I'm just like, I read that book when it first came out and I was like, ooh, in trouble. I made some progress over the years, yeah. but there's still some edges that need to be sharpened a little bit or dulled, depending on how you look at it. So uh, w- what does that mean to you? 
You know, I read early on in my sabbatical, I read through and studied John 15 at length where, you know, Jesus here in the final discourse talks to his disciples, you know, as they're leaving the upper room, heading to the garden, and he is passing these uh, vines and branches, and he says, John 15, 5, you know, uh, if you remain in me and I remain in you, you'll bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can't do anything. And I was really struck by, here's Jesus leaving his disciples to fulfill this overwhelming challenge, right? This huge mission. And he doesn't give them a five-year plan. He doesn't say, here's your checklist. He doesn't strategize with him, them. He just says, stay connected to me. And that word abide or remain shows up again and again in that passage. And it's all about connection. If you stay connected to me, you'll bear much fruit. What I had done is, and this is such a religious thing to do, right? <laughs> is that I had confused the two. I was thinking that connection with Jesus happens through production, that if I produce enough, that that keeps me connected or somehow earns me connection. Connection. I never would have said that. Like, I understand sure. theologically that that's not accurate, but I was living in a way that reflected that value, that connection happens through production. I got to produce my way into it. And John 15, Jesus just pushes on this and says, no, it's all about connection. And out of connection, production comes. And, and I just began to recognize how, as a pastor, but also as a husband, also as a father, that I was getting that flipped. I was trying mm. to produce my way into connection. And I really needed to reprioritize around connection and then trust that production would come from it. You know, it's interesting because you mentioned family. You're getting into the empty nest stage. You were telling mm -hmm. me your youngest just graduated high school. You know, my kids are 31 and 27. And I was talking to my oldest son last night. And he's very, he's a software engineer, so he's no slouch. But he's very good at disconnecting mm -hmm. from work and just being rather than doing. And he really challenged me about five years ago, around the time that I started to work on on uh, At Your Best. And... You know, we went to an all-inclusive and he said, dad, your job is to relax. Mm. That was so uncomfortable for me. It was so hard just to relax because there's always activity, right? Like, oh, we'll go into this town today or let's go here for breakfast. But an all-inclusive, you basically lie around. You know, there's a few things to do. And I've been on that journey now for five years, four years, whatever that is. And, and you're right that doing should flow out of being, but no, not, not for me either, naturally. So um, say more about your sabbatical, and then I want to talk about what's happened since you've come back and how that's changed things. But I, I don't, I, we got time. So okay. go ahead. What else did you learn? What else did you learn on your summer vacation, Kyle? Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, to, to connect it to your son's conversation with you, I learned that even if I can handle some of those things, it doesn't just affect me, it affects the people around me, right? If I'm worn out, then I'm wearing people out. Uh, and Ooh. I I saw that that was true, that as much as I needed a sabbatical and a break and some healthier rhythms there, the people around me needed me to have that because um, they were tired because I was tired. And uh, so I, one of the things that happened around the same time is uh, a buddy of mine knew that I hadn't been myself lately, recognized some things, tried to challenge me on them. I kind of minimized it. I have this tendency to be positive about everything, which is a strength, but can also have a pretty big shadow side. And uh, and he finally said, look, you, you just need to make an appointment with this executive coach that I know. And I'm like, yeah, okay, you know, executive coach, maybe that's a good executive idea coach. for other people. That's how to get a pastor to a counselor. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's what happened, man. I, I made an appointment with this guy. I get a month or a few minutes into that conversation, and I'm like, oh, bro, you, you are a therapist who calls them, himself an executive pastor so, or executive coach, so people like me will call you. And, sheep in wolf's clothing, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and one of the things he really helped me with that— ended up being an important exercise during my sabbatical was to understand there are some things that are good to grieve, right? Like I had a hard time recognizing sadness. Um, it, instead, it surfaced for me in frustration. 
And so he kept saying to me, you know, when's the last time you were sad? And I'm like, man, I'm, I, I'm not a sad person. I don't know. It's, and he said, no, I just, want, I just want you to write down sometimes you were sad this week. And, you know, honestly, that seemed like a silly exercise. But, but what I discovered was that things that were making me sad looked like frustration, irritation. Mm. Uh, mm. That's how they surfaced. Uh, Badness is anger. Sadness, sadness is anger, yeah. S- yep, I'm and familiar with that. So here, mm-hmm. I'll give you an example of this. Like there was yeah. this um, yeah. couple in the church who had been around for quite a long time, pretty connected in ministry with us. And I found out that they were going to be leaving because they didn't agree with some ways we were handling some tough situations. And when I heard it, I was really frustrated. I scheduled an appointment to sit down and express my frustration with them. And it, before that, I talked to my executive coach friend, and he's like, hey, are you frustrated that they're leaving? Or are you sad that they're leaving? I'm like, mm, I'm sad, you know, yeah. sad. Yeah. Um, it hurts. And, and so I sat down with them and just said, hey, I love you all. I'm sad about this and expressed that differently. And I just began to recognize that there was, you know, this grieving that needed to take place, partly because in 2019, we had that transition um, had all kinds of big plans and like everybody else, you know, COVID comes in and uh, messes it up. And I didn't really grieve the loss of all of that work. I just tried to push through it. And then when it wasn't working, I just got frustrated and tried to help push the people around me more like, Hey, we're going to still start these campuses. We're going to still, you know, we're not going to let these things slow us down. Um, Instead of, instead of grieving some of those things, um, I, I, it was surfacing in, in, um, frustration or anger. Thank you for sharing that. I think that is such a huge issue. Um, I can relate to that. I remember, you know, in my own life, I had asked not at your best, but didn't see it coming. I had asked a couple of people to write a forward. The publisher thought I needed a forward. And I asked two people that I knew well, and both said no. Because they were just busy. And as you know, writing a forward is a lot. And they're, they're great friends to this day. And at first I was like kind of angry and then, you know, insecure. It's like, oh gosh, they don't even like me. And then I realized I'm sad. Mm. And yeah. I spent the morning in both cases just kind of not quite going all psalmist like David on, on God, but close. Like, wow, I'm just really sad. And I felt it. And by noon it lifted. And literally, I've texted both of them in the last 48 hours, and they're great friends to this day. Mm-hmm. It was just, they were busy. How, how did the couple that you met with, how, how did they handle it? Because I can imagine going in, you know, if you're all irritated, frustrated, aggravated, you're kind of going to leak all over them. But if you just sat down and said to me, you know, I'm really sad you're leaving, that would feel good. Yeah. I don't know. How did, that, how did that meeting go? Yeah, it kept us connected. Um, you know, wow. it... it allowed there to be more of a partnership in that. Mm. And um, I better understood where they were coming from. And there were some personal things that had led to that decision that I would not have taken the time to listen to. Um, and, and, and so it's kept us connected. It's, it, I think it kept there from being, you know, division or for the cumulative effect of that, you know how it is, like those things start to add up, right? And I felt like that was able to be processed in a way that kept that account um, balanced, and mm-hmm. and so, you know, the relationship stayed in stayed intact. This has been pretty fruitful for three months. Uh, anything else that really got reprogrammed over those that sabbatical? Um, you know, I'm trying to, you know, so. Here's one of the biggest things that came out of it. Uh, I understood Galatians 6 2 in a different way, you know, where it says, bear one another's burdens. I was so bad at asking for help. I am embarrassed at how many people around me are highly capable and more than willing to help if I would have asked them, if I would have first recognized my need for it, and secondly, if I would have asked them for help. And, and so I feel like I learned, you know, 
to ask for help and learn to bear burdens with one another. I, I have a pastor friend in Phoenix who during that time, we just started having weekly conversations where I would tell him a few hard things that I was dealing with and he would tell me a few hard things he was dealing with and we wouldn't try to fix it for each other. You know, we would wow. just listen and um, encourage each other. Sometimes we'd laugh a little bit and kind of a knowing laugh. Uh, and I would say before this, that would have seemed like an, uh, it wouldn't have seemed that helpful. Like what, what changed? Nothing really changed. But the, the value of bearing burdens like just saying, hey, here's something heavy right now. Um, I think before this, I would have felt like I was complaining or whining. And mm-hmm. I just don't do well mm-hmm. with, you know, whiny people. I don't ever want to be a whiny person. But that's not what it is. It's bearing a burden. No. And so some of the relationships that came out of that time where I I started to be a little bit more vulnerable around those things, um, I, I just changed how I recognized the need for that kind of um, – brotherhood or that kind of burden bearing. Appreciate you sharing that. Um, so you're back. What's different? Um, I, I think a, a few things, uh, you know, personally that are different. Um, I'm going slower. Like there's a saying in some branch of the military, smooth is fast. Uh, and and uh, or slow is smooth, smooth is fast. You're you're, is right? you're a voter too, right? Slow is pro. That's slow if you pro. ever want to dock your boat, slow is pro. Okay, that's yeah. so true. Slow it's crazy. Pro. True. That works. Slow is pro. Hundred yeah. percent. Okay. Yeah, uh, and know how to use reverse. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so slow is smooth, smooth is fast. And one of the things that changed for me is recognizing how true that is. Like I like to move quickly and. Being able to recognize the need to sometimes go quickly by slowing down, by, you know, engaging key stakeholders more strategically. Um, some of that really helped to, you know, by stepping back, those things just became more obvious. Um, and so coming back with more intentionality um, around that, you know, I, I would also say one of the things that um, has changed is just better recognizing the difference between the time management and the energy management and being more intentional there. And, and then part of that is just friendships and relationships and, um, you know, spending some of that time with the right people to re-energize rather than just, Hey, I'm, I'm going to take a break and rest, but not necessarily do anything. So some, you know, some of those habits, um, changed. You mentioned learning about your energy. What what are you learning about managing your energy, not just your time? And by the way, for those, I mean, you probably heard the bio listeners of, of Kyle. I mean, you do lead one of the largest churches in the United States. So it's not like, you know, you don't have 70 hours worth of work that could happen if you chose to make it happen. But what are you learning about managing your energy? Uh, for me, it's that it starts in the morning. If I can be intentional with the first 30 minutes of my day and uh, really plan out and pray through how I'm going to spend my day, the conversations I'm going to have. Um, you know, here's what I want to think through and pray through in the car. You know, here's, um, here's a meeting where I know I need to be a little more intentional with encouragement. And I, as I pray through my day that way, it, um, it gives me a different kind of energy that comes from purpose and intentionality. Um, so, for me, starting in the morning makes all the difference on how my energy level is in the afternoon and the evening when I come home. If I skip out on that morning time, it doesn't work. I think of uh, Jesus and Mark, I think it's one, it might be chapter two. It's that passage where it says early in the morning while it was still dark. But what doesn't always get followed up on in that story is the town comes to that house and they all have expectations of Jesus for that day. And after having time in the morning, with the father, Jesus comes back and he says to them, sorry, y'all, we're heading to the next town. And what allowed him to determine his day wasn't the expectations of the crowd. It was spending time in the morning with his heavenly father. And I think the intentionality of not letting people dictate your day with their expectations, but being purposeful and dedicating that time to what God has in mind uh, 
changes the energy, right? It gives you a different, a, a different kind of energy for it. Um, the other thing for me is getting out of town. I recognize that I just need to get out of town once in a while. And um, being intentional to schedule that and plan that, I don't need to go somewhere exotic. You know, it doesn't need to be very far. I just need to get out of town. And, um, and something for me happens when I get out of town with people I love um, that is really replenishing. So I'm trying to be more intentional about scheduling those types of things. What does getting out of town look like for you? Because I hear you, you know, like, like sometimes when you're at home, it's like, well, garden needs to be weeded. The lawn needs to be cut. This needs to be fixed. Right. You just get caught in the busyness. What does getting out of town help with? Well, you know, that goes to the production connection conversation, right? Like the value of getting out of town is that you are released from all these uh, production pressures that you can't get away from when you're at home or when you're in town. And when you get out of town, a lot of that production pressure goes away. Uh, Most of us know that to be true if it's a week somewhere that we've planned on a vacation, but just having short, shorter windows around that. So, you know, we'll go to the lake an hour and a half down the road from our house and just having, having some time uh, where there's no, there's no pressure and production is not on the list and it's just a time for connection. Like that's what's replenishing for me. What about hobbies? What do you do for hobbies? Oh man. Do you have any? I, you, I, I hope you cut Uh-oh. this. I feel like okay, my wife sent it. you this. So my, <laughs> she's, she's on me right now. She's like, you've got to uh-huh. get a new hobby. You've got to get on. So my son just graduated from high school and he and I did, you know, we would do a lot together. And, um, and so now, you know, we're at home together and I, I, she just has too much of my energy. She's like, you need to find, <laughs> you need to find right. a hobby. So right. you're a little much, Kyle. So I'm working on it. Like I'm working okay. on uh, finding a hobby, but, uh, that I'm definitely in hobby transition. Well, that's, you know, that's okay. <laughs> Writing used to be my hobby, man. And then it became my life. So, yeah. you know, what are you, what are you going to do? Yeah, yeah. Hobbies are fun. I have a weird one, knife sharpening. Come on, Literally. really? Yeah. So this is what a this great kind of for hobby. <laughs> sharpening the knife. You're that sharp. can go very dark very fast. <laughs> but uh, no, I uh, dull knives in the kitchen are a pet peeve of mine. Okay. And we tried all these little contraptions over the years that I bought at kitchen stores or online that are supposed to sharpen your knives or you have to bring them in to get them sharpened. And my boys for Christmas got me this thing called the Horl. Too. Okay. We'll link to it in the show notes. It's just, it's beautifully designed. It's beautifully made. And you can literally get things sharp enough to slice through paper. And, you know, tomato cuts are really, that's how you know whether your knife is sharp or okay. not. I mean, no pressure on the knife. It just kind of just, choo, just goes right in like a hot knife through butter. And uh, so often I'll just take 10 minutes, sharpen some knives, or sometimes sit down for an hour and sharpen everything in the kitchen. And that's really weird, but I'll tell you, there's something very soothing about it. And then I'm very excited to go chop some vegetables. I, hey, I see your lawn lines. Yeah. So I, I know there's, that's got to be a little bit of a hobby there. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Or maybe I need to go see your executive coach and unpack what's <laughs> underneath all that stuff, right? Yeah. I do find, totally, totally. I do find it therapeutic. We live on a, a farm. My wife and daughter run a horse farm here in Kentucky. And so oh, cool. we live on this horse farm. And I do find it therapeutic to get the chainsaw out and just cut down things. Um, oh yeah, it, yeah. So I I don't want that to be a hobby though, because I get credit for it right now as work. Um, but I so I need to I need to find I need to find some hobbies. Right. When you look out at the state of leadership today, and we've all been through so much over the last four or five years, what are some of the patterns you see in other leaders? You know, knowing what you know now about energy management, rest, uh, the gift of the quote for sabbatical and so on. What would your counsel be to other leaders who are maybe feeling the pressure or hearing themselves in this, this story? Uh, You know, I'd I'd say a couple of things. One is that there is a pressure that uh, feels especially intense these days to take more of a pundit approach to being a pastor where it's this constant daily, do I comment on this? Do I post about this? People want to hear about these things. And the more you do it, the more of an expectation there is every time there's an opportunity for it. And so to not think of yourself as abundant, right? To not think of yourself as a commentator on culture doesn't mean you don't speak mm. to these things. It doesn't mean you're not selective as a, uh, a voice on what you want to address, but you, it's not your job. It's not my calling 
to comment on everything that happens. And I know how much pressure I get to do that. And so I'm sure other pastors and leaders feel that as well. Um, but to say it's okay, like give yourself permission. Like that's not, that's not what it means uh, to, to be a pastor, uh, even though there's that, that very real pressure these days. Um, I, I think it's an intense challenge for us as pastors, as leaders, is, you know, moving from this, um, you know, high trust to low trust culture. I, I mean, I feel this mm. so intensely from five years ago where I felt like, you know, there's a benefit of the doubt. Um, and now that just isn't the case. Uh, mm-hmm. you, you know, and I know that's not unique to the church. I know that is true in organizational authority as well, but, but just this, the constant questioning, you know, this this um, high doubt culture that we live in. One of the questions that I'm constantly thinking through is, you know, how do we uh, how do we build a high trust culture, right, in a world mm. where it's so low trust right now? It is, and yeah. I, so one of the things that helped me with this is to to think of myself as a if, if I went to a, a a different country as a missionary. And I understood that culturally that this was the challenge. That wouldn't discourage me or overwhelm me. What feels discouraging about it is how much that's changed uh, here, at least in my context. Uh, it, it changed so quickly that it, it's easy to be frustrated or feel bitter about it. Um, but really it's accepting like, oh, no, this is the world that we live in now. This is the, the people that we're called to love and lead. So how do we, how do we build that, that high trust um, culture. And I was a church planter before coming here. I remember like in the nineties, the challenge for me as a leader was to address the church being irrelevant. The church is irrelevant. How do I make mm-hmm. the church more relevant? That was the focus. I feel like the shift that's taken place, and I don't want to state this too strongly, is that the perception of the church went from being irrelevant to being dangerous. And so now I'm trying to address that perspective, not focus so much on how do I make the church relevant, but how do I make the church safe? Um, how, how do I build that kind of trust? And so some of the opportunities that we are trying to lean into now, it's not so much about relevance. And by the way, there's something very freeing about that, but uh-huh. it's more about the perception that it's, it's dangerous or it's not it's not it's it's not trusted and um and leaning into that rather than the relevance issue i think is is an important um it's impo- it's an important shift that we that we start making well that ties into the pressure you feel to be a cultural commentator right all the pressure and it probably ties into that meeting you had with the couple who was leaving because somehow trust got fractured. And, and I get it. It would be easier, you know, to look at your predecessors, Dave Stone and Bob Russell, who obviously had their own battles to fight and go, well, it was easier back then. You know, this is, this is hard now. What are you doing to build trust? You know, I think you're totally right. Low trust, low trust in the church, low trust in pastors, yeah. low trust in leadership, low trust in institutions, organizations. I mean, you're right. It's it's just shifted. So what are you doing to build trust in a low trust, high doubt culture? You know, one of the things we're doing is working hard to meet obvious felt needs that we see in our community. I'll, I'll give you an example of this. We did a, a marriage series a few months ago. And in the past, the focus of a marriage series might have been on relevance, like, you know, we want to engage people in in this and really identify what their challenges are and make it, you know, make it as uh, uh, captivating as possible. But this time we we focused on helping as many couples as we could, and so we made uh, marriage counseling available to any couple who needed it. And we had four hundred and thirty seven couples uh, sign up, and we said we'll pay eighty percent of your marriage counseling for up to six months, and. Um, and what that did was it didn't just communicate to those couples that we love you, we care about you, we're here to help you. It sent a message to our church family and to our community that 
that we we really care. We're not just preaching a sermon series on this. <laughs> like we really want to help each of those couples. I think that that builds trust when you can demonstrate like genuine one at a time uh, compassion. It also makes you relevant, by the way. But it uh, first mm. and foremost, you know, builds trust. Um, m- for me, what I can become a little bit resentful of, but I am trying to learn to embrace is I've got to just explain the why on things all the time. Like, here's why we're doing this. I got to double down on it. I have to remind people. I I think when there's a low trust culture, just coming back to here's why we're doing what we're doing Um, and and learning to um, over communicate the why, uh, especially with key stakeholders who will influence other people. Um, uh, You know, that feels like a lot of work sometimes, but I, I think that that goes a long way. So for me, if I go visit different groups or different classes or different campuses where I know there's some distrust, like I don't want to do that. I'd rather not go do that. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. going in and having that conversation and trying to address the why we're doing it, um, I've discovered can go a long way. So how do you do that at scale? Because it's one thing if you're pastoring a hundred people, you can kind of go one by one and you're pastoring tens of thousands of people. So how do you, and you have a large staff and multiple locations. So how do you, how do you rebuild trust at scale? Yeah. I, one of the ways that we do that is, is certainly through preaching and through the sermon series. As an example, like next year, uh, 2024, we're just going to take the whole year and go through Romans one of the reasons we're doing that, though, is to build trust. Like, there's this paranoia um, around, um, you know, churches. Uh, are you staying grounded in Scripture? Are you and, and so I like the idea of taking 2024 and hitting a book all the way through. Not for that reason primarily, but here's what happens: Romans 13, 14, talking about um, Christians and government, talking about. Unity in the church. Guess where that lands? You know, it lands for oh, right us, around November, right perhaps, around November, October? right around our election yeah. season, and and so um, allowing Scripture to be the foundation for which you have these conversations, um, I think builds trust. Like the, Scripture's the impetus, rather than like this platform or this agenda or this thing that you always have to question. Well, where are they coming from, and why are they talking about this now? Like allowing allowing scripture to set the terms for that conversation, um, I, I think that, that that goes a long way. But asking you know key stakeholders to be a a voice, an advocate, um, I, I, I think that that helps a lot. I've, I I have discovered that if I can humbly say you know to some folks who've been around here a long time, um, hey, I could really use your help with this. Here's you know. We're getting ready to start another campus, and it, you know I want you to feel good about this decision that we're making because I know if you feel good about it, other people will as well. And you know, trying to intentionally write out those key stakeholders and have some of those conversations, um, I think bears a lot of fruit. So I'd love to drill down a little bit more on relevance because, yeah, I hear you. I mean, I was around in the 90s too, and we were driving motorcycles onto stages and playing cool music. And, you know, it. looking back on it, some of it looks a little bit ridiculous, but you had to be there, right? And yeah, right. it was effective and people actually <laughs> got baptized. But now it almost feels like, and this is where I want to go and I want to get your thoughts on it. Like there's the orthodoxy police that are out there watching you and, you know, are you really a Bible believer, Kyle? Or have you, you know, gone astray? Uh, I see a lot of churches turning inward. And the opposite, the reason I still think about relevance is the opposite of relevance is irrelevance. And there's kind of a beautiful irrelevance. You know, you can talk about detachment, you can talk about Jesus, was he relevant? No, he he was of another kingdom. But there's also, I, I don't think the church is supposed to be irrelevant to culture too. Right. God so loved the world and we're supposed to reach the world and embrace the world. And it almost feels like we're moving in the opposite direction. What, what are your thoughts on, on how relevance plays out in the mid-2020s? Uh, well, I do think you're right about Jesus as kind of an example of this. Like how often in his teaching it came out of maybe a question someone had in the crowd or a conversation between brothers. Like he, he connected it to something right in front of them. Right. Uh, mm-hmm. So there, 
certainly is uh, an example of, of being relevant in that way. But what you find if you study the Gospels on this is the disproportionate amount of space that is committed to um, these one-at-a-time moments, these one-at-a-time encounters that Jesus has with people. I think the relevance of the kingdom there is directly connected to one-on-one life transformation. And the more I can connect that for people in our church, it, it communicates re- relevance without turning the church into, you know, the uh, riding the Harley up on stage approach, right? So one mm-hmm. of the things we talk about a lot, if you walk into my office, in fact, there's a wall that just says one at a time stories. And we just have all kinds of examples of that. When, when we're talking about how God's moving in our church you know, much more likely than us saying, hey, here's how many people came. We're going to be talking about, here's the name of a person. Here's a picture. Here's a life that was changed and transformed. And I think by focusing on those one-at-a-time stories, you're you're accomplishing relevance. Like, yes, it's incredibly relevant when you see the transforming power in the gospel, uh, of the gospel in someone's life like that. Um, but you're being relevant without you know, sacrificing mission without um, minimizing the gospel. In fact, you're, you're elevating those things. So I, it's one of the ways that I think we're working to be relevant. Um, we, we have uh, worship services in like 17 addiction recovery centers here in Kentucky in the area. Mm-hmm. Like this is a, it's a really big need. Um, that's relevant, right? Like that, that affects and connects to a lot of, a lot of people. So to understand relevance as connecting the gospel to people in a transformative way, I think that gives you a healthy, healthy way to be relevant. And, um, and so that's, we try to keep that as the focus. One of the things I think you and I share is uh, a desire to see the church be outward focused. And if you're a church planter, I mean, that's in your DNA and everything. And that's, I think, Southeast's thing over the years is you've reached a lot of people. I don't know if you're familiar with Ryan Burge or not. Do you know that name? No. He has a great sub stack. I link to him quite a bit in my work these days, and I think he's going to be on the podcast next year too, which is great. Um, but I was reading an article he did, and it's something like 65% of Republicans don't trust anybody. Mm. And then he made the point that a lot of evangelical churches, white evangelical churches, are basically a bunch of Republicans. Mm. And one of the reasons that there's, and I know some churches are diverse, and I think that's a good thing, and I think you should reach across the aisle, have people who, who vote differently. One of the points he makes is we're so inward looking, because we don't trust anybody, that we're losing the Great Commission. Mm. That, that if you really don't trust anybody, and it's everybody who thinks like us and believes like us and votes like us, we're kind of losing our mission. Any thoughts on how to keep a church outward focused in this culture? Because I think the gravitational pull is inward. Yeah. You know, I the word that we use uh, here is unleashed. Like that we want our church to understand that uh, we are really only the church when the full force of the church is unleashed outwardly. And uh, so we, we try to make the mission less about you know, our programs that we're offering and more about um, the relationships and the connections that they have. You, you know, when we're starting new campuses, that helps a lot keep this outwardly focused, right? Because it's essentially starting new churches and communities where the need is significant and where we are trying to reach new people. That helps all of us do that m- more effectively, um, focusing on that. Things like this, when we do the marriage counseling thing that I referenced, like that's not just for church members, you know, Mm. that's not a perk that you get when you're a part of the church. That's for your neighbor. Like your neighbor may not come to church, but maybe you know that they're going through some challenges. As a church, we want to meet that need. So uh, make that available to your neighbor. Let the church bless, bless your neighbor in that way. And, you know, keeping it, keeping it focused outwardly, um, you know, one of our mantras that we use here is wreck the roof, you know, that we want to do whatever it takes to help one person get connected to Jesus. So we try to tell stories around that. We try to, to celebrate that. Um, we try to do things that don't make a lot of sense on paper, but can result in one person um, getting connected to Jesus. Um, so, you know, just a constant, intentional uh, focus on it. 
Mm. So your latest book is called When Your Way Isn't Working. And we talked about a lot of the things that uh, weren't working for you, but you address a lot of hot button issues, disconnection, discouragement, frustration, fatigue, anxiety. What are you seeing out there that you think are issues that we have the opportunity to help the people that we lead with? You know, I think modeling the way of connection is um, is really timely. What I mean by that is I would have felt this pressure early in ministry to model the way of production. Like the way that I set the example and impress the people around me is by producing, producing, producing. I can tell you that more than ever, that does not impress people. Like uh, there, <laughs> there is a lot of... Um, freedom when you understand that modeling connection actually is really helpful. Um, and, and so I would have to say that before my sabbatical, I was a little bit of a hypocrite about this. I would, you know, talk about the value of connection or I would, I would try to prioritize that with staff and lead, but I didn't model it very well. And, um, and I think we have to, I think we have to model that. We have to set the example for that. The same is true with being a more vulnerable about weaknesses. Um, one of the things I did on this break was I, I was challenged to ask 10 people close to me to give me three things in my life that needed growth. Like, don't hold back. I, I'm in a season where I can process it. I, I want to know the truth. Give it to me. And, um, you know, my wife didn't keep it to three things. But other than that, most, <laughs> most people did a pretty good job of this. But they... I was surprised at how much time they took and how many of them, you know, they didn't just give me a list. Like they wrote some things out and um, I invited that. I, I, I discovered in that process how freeing that was, by the way. I thought it would be incredibly discouraging, but I discovered that there is a lot of freedom when people around you know the weaknesses that you're already aware of and they still want you to lead. Yeah, that's mm. all. That was I'm like, I thought you were following me because you didn't know these things, but you, oh, wow. you knew these things and, you know, it was okay. Like I, I felt it to be very freeing. But what happened out of that is I started to see different people on staff and different people in my circle do the same thing. Like they, they huh. reached out, they asked, I, a number of them have asked me, Hey, what's three things here? And, uh, and, and so, you know, I, there's just a lot of power in modeling that. I, I, for me, Carrie, like you did this for me. Others did this for me. You gave me permission to talk about the discouragement, the frustration by sharing your story and not by just telling me things that I frankly already would have known. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to do the same thing is if I was just reading a book about this is what you should do and what you shouldn't do, it would just feel like more pressure and it would feel like shame. And I would probably double down on my dysfunction, right? But when, <laughs> when, when other leaders will model that and be a little vulnerable with it, it gives permission for the rest of us to do it. And then that gives permission for the people we lead to do it. Um, and, and that's been very healthy for, for us. I think what I have to remind myself over and over again is people admire your strengths, but they really resonate with your uh, weaknesses. Yeah, 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 and that's, yeah. that's the key. So when you got that list, 10 people, three things each, did you get 30 different things or was it like the same three or five things over and over again? What did you, what did you yeah, learn? There were, there were some of the same things, you know, over and over so again. They all saw it. They all saw it. They did. And you know what was really hard for me and humbling is they were all things my wife had told me for years. You know, that, that was hard because I'm like, oh yeah. man, she was, she could see it and she was right about things. And, um, and, and, and so having other people echo that was, like I said, it was very freeing for the most part, but it also was, was challenging. And, um, uh, uh, but I was grateful for it. I felt, I felt it was weird. I felt loved in that process, uh, mm -hmm. instead of feeling criticized, like that they cared enough to do this and, and um, and still said, hey, we we want to follow. We want to, you know, we're not backing down. So that yeah, was good. When you look back before you took the three month break, had you kept going, what do you think might have happened? Yeah, um, 
I, I tell people that I think things worked the way that they should work, right? Like I had, I had people in my life who were in a position to say, hey, this isn't healthy. You need to do something about it. I had accountability where when it wasn't, wasn't fully my choice um, that I, I had to be accountable to it. I had examples of people who had, had done that, who coached me and encouraged me. You know, I looked back before this interview, uh, before this podcast, I looked back at some uh, messages that I had back and forth with you and you telling me at the beginning of that, hey, it's, it, it's not perfect, you said, but it's so much better on the other side. And, and having those types of voices, like that's the way it, that's the way it should be. Um, and, and so I w- am thankful that there was ex- accessibility, that I had I, people around me who could speak that into me, that I had accountability. Um, and um, if I had not had that, you know, I, I don't know. I think it would have gone from being worn, you know, worn out to being burnt out. I certainly think I would have mm-hmm. been on that tra- mm-hmm. trajectory. Um, and, uh, it, but it felt to me, I, I compare it a little bit like going to the doctor early versus going to the doctor when, you know, your body is shutting down. If you can stage four. Yeah. 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 And so being able to, um, see some symptoms because others have done, you know, work and made an effort in this area mm. and address it is so good. I, instead of waiting until it's yeah stage four. I am so thankful for your vulnerability today. You know, Kyle, I think I've told you this before, but you know, my burnout happened a long time ago after a decade in leadership. But although it was the greatest and hardest thing I've gone through in my life, um, I now see it as a gift. I think if I had kept going, I would have been roadkill. Like just another statistic, another story, and God was merciful enough to kind of arrest me and uh, make it so that my body didn't work anymore and my mind didn't work anymore and got me on a different track. And, you know, it's been 17 years of recovery and daily disciplines and growth and mistakes and all that. But it's, it's and I'm not there yet, right? Like, I think, I think I'll be working on it <laughs> into my 60s, 70s, 80s and beyond. Um, but, but it is so much healthier. It is so much better. What, what do the people around you notice now? You can start with your wife or coworkers or elders or friends. Like what, what, what do they see Kyle before Kyle after? What do they see? Uh, I think more joy for sure, you know, which is my natural disposition. I, 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 you know, I went through a season there where uh, I would say I was discouraged, which is normal enough. But if you kind of live without courage Mm. for too long, you doesn't just affect you like the people around you really see it and notice it and uh you know my including my kids like they can tell you know they can tell a difference in in that um i I think you know one of the one of the things that people around me have seen is just being more present you know one of the things that got my attention early on in this process was you know when my wife said hey you're coming home and you're laying on the couch and getting on your phone uh (laughs) more days than you're not and, um, uh-huh. and she knew that, I mean, she knew that's not me. That's not, uh, um, and, and just being more engaged and present with, with people. I think that, um, that has certainly been true. And then dreaming again, you know, where mm-hmm. you're, you're not just, uh, putting out fires and thinking uh, that the day is about, you know, the urgent decisions that have to get taken care of, um, but having more space to dream. Um, I mean, that's, that's changed. It's changed the way I, I worship. I find myself, um, I, 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 my favorite place to worship is in the shower until the water goes cold. And, uh, you know, <laughs> I, I just have found myself doing, doing that more often. So, you know, some of those, you, you know, some of those things I think, I think have, uh, have, have been noticed. Kyle, this has been so good. A surprise, actually. You told me you had three months off, and I'm like, all right, we need to talk about that. And here we are an hour later. Any other word you want to share? Your book is called, the latest one, you've got a bunch, but When Your Way Isn't Working, and it's available anywhere. And you talk about a lot of these things, but I really appreciate you picking up the rocks and looking underneath at the creepy, crawly things together, because we all have that in leadership. Like, there's nobody... If, if you've led for more than 20 minutes, there's no way you can't relate to this conversation. Mm-hmm. So anything else you want to share? You know, I, I just want to 
make sure that the people who are listening to this, you know, and are seeing some of those things will acknowledge them and recognize them the same way I did in listening to this podcast, right? Like this conversation helped me get to the doctor early, helped me make some changes, helped me step away, get some perspective. Um, and so, you know, my prayer is that the leaders who are hearing this, um, who were, who are where I was, you know, a year, two years ago, um, would take those same steps. And um, so I'm grateful. I mean, honestly, I'd rather come on and talk about other things than, um, than this, but this is what I needed um, at the time. And so uh, my prayer is that it would be, do the same thing for others that it did for me. So maybe this is the intervention, yeah. listeners, um, which would be good. And, and let me ask you, because it was very, very hard for me to admit I needed help. I started going to counseling maybe three years before I burned out and trying to get, get help. And obviously, you know, then I kind of slid into the ditch and it was obvious I needed to, a new course in the future. Um, but I remember going to a counselor for the first time, one of the hardest things I had to do. I had to swallow so much pride, so much pride go, yep, I need help. What, was that hard for you? Like, did you have to swallow some pride? Yeah. You know, I, I felt a lot of shame uh, around that. And I realized that, you know, part of that shame was asking for help or even needing help. Um, you know, Townsend talks about this, that the more you're a source person, meaning the more you're a person that people go to for help, the less likely you are to have source people. And that had become Ooh. true in my life over a period of time without me really recognizing that that was true. And then by the time I recognized it, I was embarrassed by it. And it just kind of fed into the cycle of not doing it. Like I knew I should have asked for help, you know, earlier, but because I didn't, it made me less likely to do it now because I was embarrassed that I hadn't done it. And, um, and, and so a sabbatical kind of forced that, right? Like it, it, um, I, I, I knew that I needed to do, I, I had this conversation, uh, you know, with a friend at the beginning of this, I felt like the communication around it was confusing. I was concerned with, with what people would think. I, and so in my frustration, I said to my friend, I'm like, yeah, hey, yeah, I'm afraid people are going to hear this and they're going to think there's been some kind of moral failure. And, and he stopped me and he's like, um, Hey, you, you know, you are a moral failure, right? Like, you know that, right? <laughs> and, uh, and I'm like, no, you know what I mean? Like, you, you know, you know what I'm trying to say? And he's like, no, like you're, you're are, if you spend these next three months concerned about what degree of moral failure people think you are, then you don't really know the gospel very well, right? Like he really called me on that. And, and so to be able to, uh, find yourself in a place where you've been humbled enough that asking for help seems like, like the, uh, you know, that seems like the, the, not just the right thing to do. Like that seems like the mature thing to do. Like it, it was the right kind of pressure to ask for help. If I can put it that way. My goodness. I mean, I don't know what to say after that. I'm a moral failure. <laughs> yeah. You're a moral failure. Yeah. That's right. It's this line. It's this preposterous line we have, and it's probably different in everyone's head. Yeah. I'm not a million. You know, I haven't woken up with another woman. Therefore, yeah. I'm not a. You know, I haven't stolen money. I haven't. Therefore, I'm not a. You're right. Yeah. Your friend. What a gift. Yeah. What a gift. Yeah. yeah. In hindsight. Wow. In hindsight. In hindsight. In hindsight. <laughs> yeah. Hey, friends who tell you the truth in love are the best kind yeah. of friends. Yeah. Kyle. Wow. This over delivered. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Thank you. I took a lot of notes. I'm going to re-listen to this one a few times. Um, people who want to find you online, where would they find you these days? Uh, you know, Instagram's probably good. Uh, KyleEidelman.com. I've got some resources and some tools on there. Uh, would be good as well. Thanks for leading well into the future, Kyle. Thanks, brother. <laughs>